So uh, Mike gave a good segue into ours by saying, you know, there are those IT guys that don't like to deal with other humans. So this will be a good talk, you know, easing into this. Um, and we're going to convince you that you don't want to deal with those pesky humans anymore either. But um, let's kick things off. We'll just get going. Um, Sean and I work together. We're on a team here at Party Veda, and uh, Sean lives in Seattle. I live in Dallas, and so we have a lot of times where we need to meet either in person or over video conference, um, do a webinar together, and um, it becomes a bit of a challenge. And I'm sure everybody knows trying to juggle two uh, two different schedules to find that right time, and then uh, you know. I am two hours behind Brian always, so his morning is my early morning, and so it just becomes, it comes a bit of a pain to try to uh, to get those things scheduled together. So I want you to close your eyes, envision just a few years in the future, and what what a future might look like where we have a little bit more help with these common tasks. So I want you to meet Allison. Allison is my personal assistant. I got her actually with with my latest OS upgrade. And um, she's been quite a lifesaver for me in terms of managing, helping manage my working life. Um, and I'll just let Allison introduce herself. Hello, my name is Allison, Brian's personal assistant. I am always present and always available in Brian's car, on his phone, at his home. I have learned over time to understand Brian's daily routines, and I have adjusted my style accordingly. Brian tends to want to know immediately if there are issues with his schedule. I am a digital assistant, a part of the ubiquitous OS. So my personal assistant is Tom, and I actually got Tom a little bit before, about a year before Brian did, um, and, and Brian saw how much more productive I was being with Tom and decided to upgrade. So Tom, why don't you say hi? Hello, my name is Tom, and I am Sean's personal assistant. I have supported Sean for over a year now. Sean has a busy schedule and typically has a hard time juggling his work and home schedules. His wife works for a digital ad agency and tends to have an unpredictable schedule which changes often. I have learned Sean's preferred communication style. I tend to wait until Sean asks for help rather than insert myself into conversations. I am a digital assistant, a part of the ubiquitous OS. All right. So with that, let's kind of move into what a scenario would be like when Sean and I are actually having to coordinate and juggle our, our work schedules together. I didn't really plan for holding my mic, so this is going to be my phone, this little clicker here, but we'll move with it. So, hey, Brian, how was the meeting with Acme Financials? It went pretty good. Um, you know, the client was really happy with our value proposition, and they are eager to get a proposal. He wants a proposal on his desk, like, tomorrow morning. So I was hoping when I come into town today um, that we could meet maybe around maybe around 2 o'clock. Would that work? Excuse me, Brian, but it doesn't appear you will be able to make a 2 o'clock meeting since your flight today to Seattle has a delayed takeoff by an hour and a half. It appears your flight will not land until 2.35 this afternoon. I totally forgot about that uh, push notification from American Airlines and Sean. I I'm not going to be making it in. I think the flight lands, you know, halfway to halfway to three. Um, I'll maybe get into the office around three. Do you have any time around then? I'm not sure. Uh, Tom, can you check uh, our schedule? See if we can meet after three today. I have just worked with our sister review both little calendars. It appears you won't have any other availability until six thirty tonight. Well, what about a dinner meeting? That would be great, but unfortunately your wife has a crime meeting tonight and you are supposed to care for the children, but your nanny show is available tonight. Would you like me to schedule her? Uh, that would be great. Can you notify my wife also? I just pushed a notification and informed your assistant as well. <laughs> So, um, so now that we're eating tonight, I, I really don't have a preference. Do you have any preference about where we're going to eat? Um, I'm not really in a decision mood. Tom, do you have any ideas? I see that the restaurant Sean prefers is available at seven. Do you want me to book a reservation for Harvey as for two? I'm not really in the mood for Mexican tonight, and I don't think I can. I'm really up for Javier's. Uh, what about Asian? You know, Allison is actually pretty good. She knows the area better than any of my friends do. So maybe, Allison, do you have any ideas for dinner? How about the new Thai restaurant? 
Chandelier, that is near the office. It has gotten great reviews in four of Brian's friends have spoken favorably of <laughs> That sounds great. I think uh, Allison could teach Tom a few things about the restaurants in the area. Yeah, actually she could. Allison, can you um, just kind of sync up with Tom and let him know, you know, sync up our preferences so he'll be better in the future with that? Absolutely. I am updating Tom with your preferences. Tom should be able to better assist you in the future. Thanks, Allison. Sure, I have Brian's preferences now. Please understand that Brian is not as picky as you tend to be. I will do better moving forward. Tom's got a little bit of an attitude. <laughs> um, I booked a reservation for 2 at 7 p.m. Would you like a new bird to pick you up from the client location at 645? Yes, that's great. Thanks, Allison. So, Sean, I will see you tonight, and we'll we'll review. We'll do a late night kind of proposal write up, but I think that'll work. Sounds Thanks. Good. See you then. All right. So that seems a little bit outlandish, and you're sitting there with a skeptical eye, going, "Yes, I've seen I've seen these demos before, where we have this magical computer." But if you actually think about what we saw, the technology pretty much is already here. If we think about what all was involved in that conversation that we had, we had shared calendaring, we had open table reservations going on, we had Yelp sentiment analysis and ratings, we had, you know, my my face my Facebook social stream and what they thought about certain locations and restaurants. And we had Uber requesting a pickup, we had American Airlines pushing notifications, and even um, you know, he chose to use his nanny's personal assistant, but there's even an app that supports kind of getting a babysitter the same way that you would get an Uber. You know, there's a there's an Uber for babysitting where you can just kind of call up somebody. You now, the amount that you actually trust your children with, you know, a random person like you would a random car in New York um, remains to be seen, but um, it is available. So if all that technology is there now, then what's missing? Why aren't we doing this already? Well, there's a few things that are missing to actually um, complete that circle of technology that's required. Some big ones, or the, the two primary ones, are in natural language processing, and that is improving drastically very, very quickly with a few players. It's all kind of focused in the deep learning neural network space, but what you're seeing from companies like Amazon with Alexa and Google Play, those improvements from a natural language processing perspective are gonna make natural language conversations with machines doable quite quickly and on a consumer grade scale. Additionally, what you saw that we don't have right now is omnipresence, or basically, you know, ubiquity, which is a part of what we're coining the ubiquitous OS. So you noticed, Sean and I were talking, and it wasn't some random speaker over in the corner that happened to butt in our in our in on our conversation. They were actually our personal assistants that were a part of the conversation that were in constant listen mode um, with with our conversation. When we talk about omnipresence, that that literally means everywhere, right? So in your car, in your rooms, in your home, on your telephone conversations, message bots when you're doing text messaging, um, when you're in a hotel and it automatically recognizes that you're in there, that your OS is a part of the um, omnipresence microphone in the room. It's literally, really, literally that type of ubiquity. So to kind of clarify some things, it, it kind of helps to you know, have Sir Stephen Hawking give us a quote or two. And right now we're talking success in creating artificial intelligence would be the biggest event in human history. Unfortunately, it might also be the last unless we learn how to avoid the risks. So what we want to talk about today is not some Terminator um, dystopian future where you know we're slaves to the machines, but it is a warning to consider and what we want to talk about is what the challenges to enterprises and organizations, and particularly marketing organizations, are going to experience when they're trying to adjust to this new platform that consumers are adopting. So there was a really interesting movie that not a lot of folks saw, Spike Jones directed and wrote it, um, called Her, and basically it's the story of a man who upgrades his OS, similar to how I talked about how I had Allison, my new personal assistant, 
happens to fall in love with his OS, so there's a little bit uh, Hollywood license there. I wasn't gonna fall in love with, with Allison. But the real point of this is what we're gonna start seeing is not what we've seen in the past with mobile applications where we have silos of applications, but our primary interface, our primary um, thing that we work with and interact with is going to be something that spans applications, that really understands the entire ecosystem of data that we have out there, from our calendars to our preferences to our moods to our social networks and what their calendars and preferences are, and just makes our life that much easier. And the key to that is ubiquity, where a phone is just one mechanism to getting to that uh, to that interface, but one of many. Um, it would it wouldn't make sense for me to deal, even in the future, completely in voice. If I'm sitting down at my machine and I'm looking at my calendar and Outlook, what I want is a smart artificial intelligence machine that's giving me suggestions, but in the format that I'm used to when I'm dealing with it there. If I'm sitting in my living room, I need that. Sean and I were probably both driving in cars when we were having that conversation. It would It's completely doable that we did everything that we talked about doing on our phones, but not so completely doable while we were driving. We could have had that exact conversation while driving and had everything arranged. We probably would have had to pull over if we were doing it on our phone phones on apps and try and coordinate schedules, Uber rides, the whole nine yards. Oh. So now that Brian's kind of introduced uh, the ubiquitous OS and kind of what, what this future looks like, it, it's kind of one of those things where let's come back and let's look at the here and now. Let's see what's happening and, and how we're actually moving towards that. So one of the things that, that we've seen, and, and people who know me know I, I, for some reason, keep a lot of the history in my head. But you know, in the 80s, when the personal computer really came, it gave everybody that personal space. It, it was the desktop. Everybody could do their own processing on their, on, in their own homes. Then we moved into what, we, what we've coined the age of mobile, which has really almost become an extension of us. 68% um, of all adults in the US actually carry a smartphone now. And so, and think about how far away you are at any given time from that from that device. And that has really become a personalization device where from a marketing perspective, you have something that you know that your users are always looking at. You know the apps, you know, if you want to pay extra to get the ad free, it's just one of those things that's, that's always there and has actually become quite an extension of us. What it's also brought in is it has made um, what I call the age of APIs and web services because it's made them all first class citizens in, in this broader mobile ecosystem. And what we're finding is that as we move to the ubiquitous OS, web services are at the core of what we're actually going to be doing. And then all of these services and APIs that are out there running, they're increasingly running on, cl on the cloud. This gives you, this really, the way we look at it is the cloud is a building block of ubiquity because now for your applications and services, there is an infinite amount of compute capacity. There's an infinite amount of storage capacity and it's all globally available. So now we're starting to see how we're going to be able to connect and and have that device in your hand be connected to services globally at all times. And as we look at each one of these, these all were defined as a platform. And each platform, as every platform, good platform does, there's battles for dominance in that platform. Uh, from the desktop, Microsoft and Windows clearly won the desktop battle. And then uh, in the mobile space, Apple has clearly won the um, the, the mobile battle. And in cloud, being in Seattle, I hear different opinions of who's actually winning or has won the cloud battle, but it, Amazon right now is definitely in the lead on that one. And one of the things that that shows us is that that dominance on the platform does not translate into future success. Microsoft wasn't able to take their dominance on the desktop and translate that into their mobile platform. And we're looking at Apple right now who's trying to use their dominance in the mobile space and translate that into Siri on all their devices? Are they going to be able to be successful in really making that leap and translating that dominance to all of their products? History tends to say no. History does tend to say no. 
So what are kind of the, the obstacles that, that we have today that are gonna overcome? I know in the previous presentation, there was a couple of uh, jokes about the election next week, but one of the things I've thought about pretty heavily is that whoever gets elected next week, identity is going to be one of the things that they're gonna have to address during their administration. Uh, we, we see it in the news just about every day. EU has gone through a revamping of their privacy laws. Um, there's a lot of things about identity that really right now is not very managed. If you think about, if you go shop on Amazon, you have an identity that you go. If you log into Facebook, you have a different identity. If you go into Google, you probably have a different identity. If you use LastPass, that's something to manage all these identities that you have. And when we're starting to blur the lines between the digital world and the physical world, we need to really think about it from a single identity perspective. So when I walk into a hotel, um, I should be able to look at my phone phone or my watch or have something that tells me, well, your room is room 220. And I walk right up to the room, get to the door, the door unlocks, I walk in. And if it's enabled to be, have the ubiquitous OS, then it knows I'm in the room and I have immediate connectivity to my assistant to be able to figure out where I need to go next. And so there's a lot of things with identity that'll have to be have to change in order for us to really be able to have that digital proxy. Other thing is that in the world now, and um, data equals dollars. So data that we have as we browse, it's clicked, it's tracked on a level. I know that I've, I've even put in some of those tracking systems myself, and everything is tracked that we do. And the organizations hold on to that data because it's viewed as a monetizable asset that they'll be able to, to use at a later time. And when organizations are using that data for their own financial gains, it doesn't really build a lot of trust in how I feel they're going to use my data. I certainly don't think that they're acting in my necessarily my best interest because it, it has become a revenue stream. With, um, with that also being a revenue stream, as you looked at the in a conversation that Brian and I had, it was a coordination of a lot of different services. And there was a lot of uh, intimate, we'll call it intimate information about what my favorite restaurant was. How, how, would some, how would a machine know what my favorite restaurant is other than having access to not just pieces of my data, but all of my data and being able to analyze it and know what my preferences are and where I want to go. So this is what life uh, in you, with ubiquity looks like. And so all I have to say, is there any questions? Because he looks pretty, pretty comfortable. But the real thing here is that with this, there's going to be winners and losers. Very similar to um, in the mobile space, you have the works with Android, works with iOS. As the ubiquitous OS really starts to catch on, everyone's gonna want their apps to be able to work with the personal assistants because now we're adding value to the people who are using the personal assistants, making their lives easier. And so I would ask a lot of organizations, is your icon gonna be on this picture? And so then, you know, I, I kind of talked to Brian and I said, well, we're, we're kind of using a crystal ball here. And so how do we know if what we're doing is actually, if we're on track or if this is, if we have ways of testing ourselves to see if this is what's really happening. So we've, we've broken things down into four different phases that we're seeing things occur in. Uh, one of them, the messaging APIs, we're already there uh, in a lot of cases. With the example we have here, I can go and book Amer on American Airlines lines and I can tell it make sure an Uber is there to pick me up when my flight lands. And so that's really interaction between two independent services where they're basically have an agreement with each other where they can send messages to and back and forth to each other. The next one is the ad hoc query APIs. And this is the really interesting one because this is where we are right now. Uh, right now, it, it, it's really more of a command interface. If you have an, an Echo, an Xbox, your iPhone, uh, the new Google Home device, what these are is it's really it, it's a command interface. I say, Alexa, play this song. Google Home, turn on my lights. Siri, where does a restaurant near where I am now? There's, it's very much a, a, a trigger word, and then I give it a command. And so that's really not how we interact. I know that if I did that with Brian, he'd probably say, well, you've got to move off my team now. 
But um, Google Home is actually introducing something new in that, where it's becoming context-based, so I could have a conversation with, with the device. So a good example would be, you know, Google Home, I'm coming to New York, and I'm just a huge baseball fan, and I know they're not playing tonight, but it's, uh, are, are, the Mets, are, are the Mets playing while I'm in New York? The device would say yes. Are there seats available for the game while I'm there? The device would say yes. And can you get me tickets that are $40, two tickets that are $40 a piece? And so that's the type of conversation where there were three questions being asked that were all linked contextually, and the device is able to keep up with it. Now, Google Home isn't quite there yet, but they're the first ones really taking that dive into that. And then the next one is federated cognition. And this is where we have a, a group of services working together. And what's really different about this one is that now we're starting to talk about platforms. We're starting to talk about a mechanism that can manage the orchestration of all these different services that we may need to talk to. Similar to what you saw on the slide that Brian had showing Facebook and OpenTable and Uber and, and all the different services we, we may need. And this is where, as we move to the ubiquitous OS where the platform battles are going to be fought. Because now we're talking about services that are allowing or an orchestration engine to allow all these services to really talk to each other. And in this example, very similar to the first one, but it's Siri have an Uber pick me up after my American Airlines flight lands in Seattle, where what's actually happening here is that now the platform is orchestrating all those calls and then being able to give me an answer. And then the last step will be the ubiquitous OS. And the best way I can really describe how that would be using a virtual personal assistant, which is really going to be a key face of the, of the ubiquitous OS, is in this example, we say, schedule a meeting with Brian at my favorite restaurant and have a car pick me up when it's time to go. I, it's very nonspecific. It's the ubiquitous OS knows that I like to use Uber, knows that my favorite restaurant is Javier's, and the virtual personal assistant then takes care of all the details. Alrighty, so we've we've reviewed kind of the future through our eyes and 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 what we see down the horizon. We've talked about the tech that's going to be involved to take us there, and now we want to kind of drill down into the challenges that organizations are going to face. You know, like uh, Sean Sean indicated before, we've we've helped many of our clients deal with the mobile revolution, and we have um, many clients who are taking mobile first strategies. Well, anytime you're talking about a technology wave. That, that that wave is a point in time. This is a point in time that we're talking about where mobile first won't cut it in the future. Where where things that happened in the past um, that, that worked for marketing organizations wouldn't work moving forward. Uh, so try and imagine this virtual personal assistant that's making my, I'll say my standard run of the mill buying decisions. When I have a virtual, when I have a machine that is making my buying decisions for me, marketing to humans doesn't quite work anymore. You're now having to figure out how to market to machines in order to get your product to be the one that's bought because I'm completely out of the loop in even making that buying decision. I have granted my trust to my virtual personal assistant to do that. And so there are quite a few challenges when we start moving into that model. The first one is about influencing algorithms. Now this sounds kind of, um, well, it's, it's exactly what you're gonna need to do in this model where we're talking about influencing buying decisions, but it's not completely foreign to marketing um, groups. Marketing organizations have been trying and attempting mostly successfully to influence algorithms for the, at least the last 15 years from search engine optimization to pay-per-click aggregation. That's there. The difference is that when you're doing search engine optimization, you're basically trying to game the algorithm in order to get human eyeballs in front of your product. We're now talking about the next step where you're needing to game the algorithm in order to make a purchase happen. So it's just kind of that next phase. So when we talk about investments, investments in continued algorithm optimization for marketing organizations will be one critical aspect. Additionally, sentiment is 
really high on the list. This is not new either. Um, uh, marketing organizations across the country are very focused on making sure that they have good sentiment um, out on social networks throughout um, the internet. But the difference now is if you have machines making buying decisions, that sentiment becomes even more important because algorithms will be used to not kind of review subjective analysis as a human and make a subjective decision, but literally to score the sentiment that's out on these social networks and make a scored buying decision. So sentiment becomes even more important in that model. Even when you're doing sentiment against human, human ratings, those human ratings are going to be scored by a machine to make a buying decision by a machine. But let's go one step further. With the Internet of Things, now we have another contributing factor to sentiment. Now we can have devices that are reporting on uptime for products that are talking about repair schedules, breakdown, and there's no subjectivity to them. These devices are reporting on how well the products are doing, and the machines are reading that device data and making a decision on whether or not that's a product that they're going to continue to buy for their human counterpart. So you can see that it's, it's kind of just moving more in that direction in all phases. Additionally, Sean talked about this um, kind of platform battle, and this is really critical. It was critical in the beginning stages of, of the mobile the, the mobile wars, and uh, you can't read the crystal ball and know who the winner's going to be. You can make some informed guesses, but really what's going to be required when you as an organization are making some big bets on the ubiquitous OS, you're going to need to have good strategies to um, kind of pick the players at the time that are looking most dominant, to do some proof of concepts there, to adjust and pivot when necessary as, as the market changes, because this will be a fast-moving category category that won't have winners for, for quite a long time. Additionally, from a privacy perspective, these virtual personal assistants are going to serve as the new ad blockers in this world as well. So if you think about it, like we've all experienced the event where you go shopping for tennis shoes online. And um, from that point on, for the next month or two, all you see in your Facebook feed is tennis shoes, right? Like they know you were looking for tennis shoes. But what helps with a virtual personal assistant that really knows your whole entire space is she or he also knows that you already went and bought shoes at the physical mall and she's going to prevent those shoe ads from popping up. So as a marketing organization, you have to be aware that just because you think you're pushing ads to your, to your humans, you may not be because that virtual personal assistant, just like the real life human administrative assistant prevents a CEO from getting meetings with vendors that aren't valuable to him or her, the same goes for these virtual personal assistants. They're gonna be serving as that gatekeeper and making sure that you only get the relevant marketing materials and ads that come along with that process. So what are the implications of all this? To wrap up, what we're talking about is algorithms continue to be very important in terms of understanding and influencing um, human decisions and machine-based decisions. Oh, sorry. Um, sentiment and consumer reviews will also, you will need to continue to invest heavily in making sure that you have the right um, ratings and uh, evaluations out there for your product and there's a lot of espionage that goes on in sentiment ratings and you're going to continue to have to deal with that and make sure that the algorithms that are reviewing those sentiment those sentiments uh Look, look upon your product favorably. And then really kind of hedging your bets on the right platforms, making sure that you have teams that are kind of monitoring where this um, these platforms are headed, which ones are winners, which ones are losers. It's going to change from probably every six months, just like it did in the mobile space, as you're monitoring and, and keeping track of the industry. And then from a tech perspective and in terms of investments, APIs and, ident and identity are really the key components there. A great way if you're in a marketing organization to figure out whether or not you guys are on track, and we actually do this with our vendors when we're even evaluating SaaS applications and these things, is to ask, is there anything I can do in the application you've given me that I can't access by a machine via an API? Usually they look at you like, oh, they caught me. 
And the answer is no. You look at the smart organizations like Amazon. Amazon, you actually, they have a mandate that you get fired if you release anything as a product that can't be um, accessed as an API. Because for the layman, an API is a way for a machine to do what you might do through an interface. And if we're moving to an environment where the machines are always triggering the purchasing decisions, they're tr triggering reservations, then you better make sure that it doesn't require a human sitting down to a web browser to do what you need to do. It needs to be able to be accessed by a machine. So with that, I think we're really excited about where this is headed. This seems really far off, but I guarantee if you just start opening your eyes to where things are going, um, the technology is moving very quickly and this is not like a decade away by any stretch. These are over the next few years that you'll see this really take hold. So thanks. Oh, we have questions. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so William and I have talked quite a bit about uh, customer context and understanding customers. I think that's one aspect of what, what you guys are talking about here. I think the other aspect is how do you understand the customers? Um, and so, so it's ingestion and then understanding. Like when we went to Microsoft, we saw a bit of them talking about this. What, what's your take on what technology stack is necessary to kind of bring this stuff to fruition? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good question to make sure that when, when we're talking about investing in technology stacks that we're, we're level setting. We're not saying you need to go um, sick uh, your development teams on creating a natural speech recognition platform. The, the platforms, that dominance battle is going to be won just like you wouldn't be developing a mobile OS. So when we talk about the investments that you want to be making, there's some things that there are, there, there's certainly experimentation you can be doing right now that gets you to, if we went back to Sean's slide, here, um, you most certainly should ensure that your baseline API accessible on everything that you're doing, right? Um, but from a, and from a command interface, that'll come and go, because that really just, like some of that natural language processing is gonna be handled by the platform. The, the, the path to those, those ones down below are really vendor alliances between, between different organizations. I can guarantee you that Uber probably kind of deal with American Airlines where it's like you're gonna you're gonna work with us but not Lyft that's no different than other types of alliances that you start to see forming I don't think we'll see that at the platform level where they'll say you know you can be on Siri but you can't be on Cortana or something but um, you may see that early on there's there's a little bit of siloing that people try and commit people to until they realize that's not a long-term good strategy I did have a similar question, or a follow-up question, just because you have this slide up, but one of, one of the things that I think will be the most difficult part is kind of getting collaboration across competing platforms, which will ultimately be necessary to make it really ubiquitous. So like, do you really see multiple ubiquitous OSs that you kind of opt in, like an ecosystem? Like, Because that's kind of like the world we live in today, you're either Apple or Google, or Amazon, and unless they all kind of talk to each other and actually make a pact to collaborate, we're always going to be siloed off and kind of so I would imagine, and Sean can elaborate on this after I say this, but like Sean and I in that example had two different OSs that were going on, right? So my Allison knows my data, Tom knows Sean's data, and we agree, hey, you guys can exchange information between each other for the benefit of both of us working on something. And, and we actually kind of uh, uh, talked about that from a perspective of, okay, we've got the battle is raging between Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon. So if I have Amazon- A little bit Facebook. What? A little bit Facebook. Maybe a little bit of Facebook. But think about, think about um, 
you know, we have CAPTCHAs whenever we go to log in to make sure that we're human whenever we go to certain websites. Mm -hmm. So are there going to be agreements like with Apple? Say, for example, Uber signs an agreement with Apple and I want to use Uber, but my ubiquitous OS or my personal assistant is actually running an Amazon. Are they going to prevent be able to prevent me from being able to communicate? And and what we actually landed on was that's actually probably a re will create a really interesting paradigm because then the virtual assistants will have to learn to be more human so they can act like they're human. And we actually then can go on a totally different direction from there. But I think I think that that type of thing is going to happen where the platforms during the battle, there's going to be alliances made and there's going to be incompatibilities. But when it all, as it always does, when it ends, then there, there will be one standard that kind of comes out of it, even though there may be multiple providers. David? Yeah, just an observation and question. I'll get you that point. I found it to be kind of interesting in terms of my own like digital footprint investments and where I've got kind of like an ecosystem lock in on my music and like historical investment in Apple. But like when it comes to Pandora or Yelp or a number of other applications, I pretty much can access them on Alexa or on iOS or on you know, Windows devices or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it's just interesting. I found myself now making decisions on like where I start to try to like invest more portable insights for me to be able to, uh, to access them. I'm just, it'll be interesting to see how the ecosystems respond to that. Uh, yeah, I, I think what you may see as well is there's going to need to be some kind of wall. Pandora may not trust and shouldn't trust that um, they can give me my data to where I can hand it over to uh, Spotify. But if they can trust that Allison can use that data for the betterment of me without handing it over to a competitor, and there, there, there will probably be some legislation around actually ownership of data. They try that now, but who owns the data that you have when, when you have those services? And there'll just be more of a demand for it when they can actually see the value of a, of a machine actually take, harnessing that. But it'll be hard to, early days, it's, it's going to be really um, kind of close to the chest in those services. That's a good point. I mean, like the, the Alexa will will trigger Pandora payments, but Pandora's not getting it all on these purposes and play issue. Right. Amazon is where it wants to. Right. right. So just a real quick question then, like, you didn't even mention kind of chat box and message box. Okay. I actually had that on there and I just forgot to mention it, but yeah. So, so yes. So, so what we did talk about a little bit, and I think this is critical, is I would be really skeptical if I said the next wave of this is all voice-based conversations because none of us always need to operate in that way. Depending upon the task that you're doing, if you're sitting down at a desktop, um, you're going to annoy your cube mates and everything else. If you're having to have conversations to compute a, a spreadsheet, but taking advantage of the medium that you're in, if I'm texting, which, you know, that's the other challenge that I would have, right? Like, how often am I ever talking on the phone anymore, right? Like, so text becomes really important there, and we're already seeing that with message bots. The real key thing and message message bots being if Sean and I were having that exact same conversation over text, the exact same thing could be happening, but all of a sudden we see a text message from Allison popping up instead of over voice. The exact same, it's actually, other than that natural language processing, um, actually the complex part of natural language processing is not determining the words that I say. We've got that dictation down. It's really understanding the meaning behind them. So that really has to be figured out whether or not it's in a message bot or in voice and you'll see Allison and Tom and others span span both both the, the messaging and and the voice in the message context it's almost a little more voyeuristic because it's like interpreting you know kind of the context it's not even necessarily being specifically addressed it's saying we're having a conversation around dinner right and it's like hey y'all pops up and says hey yep. it's like the vibe you know yeah. And as long as they don't become the clippy of the new modern world that say, looks like you're thinking about dinner and you're like, get away, Allison. We're just having a conversation. Right. Then, then you're good. What we saw also at the conference was that the, the technology that does speech to text and text to speech is becoming so good that it can happen so fast that they're kind of the same thing. Right. So it's, it doesn't matter if you're talking or if you're typing. Um, it understands both in the same way um, and can translate between the two of them extremely fast, right? Mm -hmm. Just like how we saw 
translation between language, where they've translated it all Wikipedia in less than a second, right? I and mean, that's crazy. It's, uh, but it's becoming the case that different mediums of uh, communication are becoming one of the same kind of, uh, kind of like what you're saying. Like, it's all integrated. So I think uh, I think I think that's right. That's where it's moving, right? And, and, you know, again, looking at the Google Home, mine hasn't arrived yet, but Next week. It's, it's the context. It's really starting to see how context is going to start playing a role in it. Because um, it's, it's, it's great uh, with these devices. My daughter, who's five, year old, five years old, can tell Alexa to play her, uh, you know, Finding Dory or some Dr. Seuss book. But what I'm really looking for is I have, I want to be able to do something and I need the answer to this question leads me to this question, which can get me to my answer. So it's really uh, looking at how that's going to evolve at this point. Can I make one more little quick? I'm going to just do this. So we did talk about dominance not being able to play into these new roles. The one caveat I would say with that is Google. And the reason is, is because the amount that they already have under their belt with just really having the index of the entire internet under them is really powerful. We were walking here through Central Park and Sean wanted to know, is FAO Schwartz still open over on whatever? And I get out Google, used voice to do it, to dictate the question of, is FAO Schwartz still open in New York? And instead of just giving the list of web answers, if you've noticed, if you ask Google a question now, usually it'll give you the answer. It doesn't just give you a web page to find it. And it said, FAO Schwartz closed last July 2015. That's not because it was prepared for that. It actually read the web page, understood what the web page was saying, and gave me an answer to my question instead of a link to a web page. So that's really, and, and Google has that over all the competitors right now, and that will give them a leg up in this, this new battle.